consider the eight planets of our solar system. The four outer planets have massive envelopes of gas, hence their name, gas giants. The four inner rocky planets, of which Earth is one, have been stripped of their massive gas shells. In 1944, Arnold Oiken published thermodynamic calculations of Earth raining out in the center of a giant gaseous protoplanet. He showed that, at the high pressures and high temperatures involved, liquid iron metal would first rain out to form Earth's core before the silicates of the mantle had yet condensed. In 1976, I verified Oiken's calculations and showed that raining out at high temperatures would produce oxygen-starved matter like the instatite chondrite meteorites. Later, I showed that the parts of the deep interior of Earth are identical to the parts of a particular instatite chondrite meteorite, and I've suggested that the Earth formed originally as a gas giant planet quite similar to planet Jupiter. Earth, together with its component of lost primordial gases, comprises a protoplanetary mass remarkably similar to the mass of Jupiter. The idea of Earth having once been a Jupiter-like gas giant is not strange at all. Gas giant planets are observed in other planetary systems as close to their stars or closer than Earth is from the Sun. So, what process in nature is capable of stripping the massive primordial gas envelopes from the inner four planets? Very young stars can experience a brief violent so-called T-Tauri phase, presumably during the ignition of thermonuclear fusion reactions. Look at the outburst from a young binary star system as observed by the Hubble Space Telescope over a period of five years. The white crescent shows the leading edge of the plume five years before the time of the present image. The distance the leading edge had progressed in five years is about 130 times the distance from Earth to the Sun. Had our young Sun experienced a T-Tauri outburst of this magnitude, it would have stripped the gaseous envelopes not only from the inner planets, but from the gas giants as well. I have shown that the rock plus alloy kernel which is now Earth, crushed by approximately 300 Earth masses of primordial gases, would be compressed to about 64% of its current radius. This is the same compression required to yield a closed, uninterrupted shell of continental rock like Otto Hilgenberg imagined. After being stripped of this great overburden of hydrogen and other volatiles, the compressed kernel of Earth would begin to decompress. The manner of decompression determines geodynamics, while the gravitational energy of compression, stored during the Jupiter-like protoplanetary stage, provides the necessary energy. The initial whole Earth decompression is expected to eventually result in a global system of major primary decompression cracks appearing in the rigid crust, which would persist as the basalt feeders for the global mid-oceanic ridge system, just as envisioned by Earth expansion theory. But here, the similarity with Earth expansion theory ends. As the Earth subsequently decompresses, the area of the Earth's rigid surface increases by the formation of secondary decompression cracks, often located near the continental margins, presently identified as oceanic trenches. These secondary decompression cracks are subsequently infilled with basalt, extruded from the mid-oceanic ridges, which moves across the ocean floor by gravitational creep 
ultimately falling into and simply filling up secondary decompression cracks. Take note, no mantle convection is required. Many of the surface observations of oceanic features and the consequences of down plunging slabs, usually thought to support plate tectonics theory, are the consequences of whole earth decompression dynamics. There are, however, global fundamental differences between whole earth decompression dynamics and plate tectonics, especially as pertains to the origin of oceanic trenches, to the fate of old seafloor, to the displacement of continents, and to the formation of oceanic troughs. The earth appears to be approaching the end of its decompression, as indicated by satellite measurements. Major secondary decompression cracks, though, are still conspicuously evident, for example, the circum-Pacific trenches, and the complementary whole earth decompression dynamics process of basalt extrusion and crack infilling continues at present, although at a slow rate. There is much, much yet to learn, especially about the time scale for whole earth decompression. Whenever new understanding emerges, there is great potential for new concepts and further advances. For example, I recently added a new geophysical heat transport mechanism called mantle decompression thermal tsunami. Heat generated from other sources deep within the earth may enhance mantle decompression by replacing the lost heat of protoplanetary compression. The resulting decompression, beginning as deep as the bottom of the mantle, will tend to propagate throughout the mantle like a tsunami until it reaches the base of the rigid crust. There, crustal rigidity opposes continued decompression. Pressure builds and compresses matter at the mantle crust boundary resulting in compression heating at the base of the crust. Ultimately, pressure is released at the surface through volcanism, earthquakes, and through secondary decompression crack formation and or enlargement. Science is about discovering the true nature of Earth and universe and sharing that knowledge with people everywhere. That's what I do. My name is Marvin Herndon. I hope you enjoyed this video and that you will wish to visit NuclearPlanet.com or UnderstandEarth.com for more information and references.